three, two, one, and we're rolling. What's going on, everyone? Dr. Michael Muller here with my uh, my good buddy, Rhett. What's going on, Rhett? Thanks for being back on the podcast. Yeah, dude. Good to be back. I'm feeling uh, good. Let's drop some knowledge bonds on people. Uh, this episode, I want to talk a lot about different biohacks. Uh, there's a lot of things out there in the space. Um, I'm, as a naturopathic doctor, I do a lot of testosterone replacement therapy, and I see a lot of people doing that wrong. There's information on the internet. I'm not giving medical advice, anything that I'm talking about. I'm just kind of giving my perspective on how I treat my patients, and, and Rhett has some experience with testosterone, so I want to jump into that. But before we go there, I did an NAD IV today, and what, what have you heard about NAD, Rhett? You're, you're pretty savvy. I know you're on the blogs. So what have you heard? Ah, well, I haven't heard much um, on it other than, okay, so it's nicotinamide. So I, I'm, I'm going to ask you, though, what's the difference between uh, that and nicotinamide riboside? Yeah, it's, it's different constituents. So NAD is the actual cofactor that's used in your mitochondria to produce. Is this an, aging, like, an aging? Is this an aging technique or is this for detox? Um, it actually was originally dubbed. I did it via IV. So NAD, uh, nicotine, and uh, nicotinamide, adin, uh, adenine dinucleotide, and you know, that's why obviously they say for sure it's NAD. And basically, do you remember learning about Krebs cycle, citric acid? You know, like um, electron too. transport chain. When you create energy, the last step in it, you need this thing called NAD to move electrons. So imagine that you're you know, your cells, mitochondria is the, the power plant. And imagine that you have big pickup trucks or, you know, dump trucks that are carrying uh, cofactors to be used. That's NAD are basically your pickup trucks. And as you age, you run out of those. So it's really hard for your mitochondria to produce energy. So, yes. you know, uh, your mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And if you're unable to produce energy, then your cells can't, you know, they can't do anything. And so originally, though, people were using NAD for um, opiate addictions. And then a couple of people used it on themselves and noticed an increased amount of energy. So what is the, what's the theory on that for, for opiate addiction? Yeah, something with it kind of resets the cells. Like one of the things with you know, opiate addiction, I think it, opiates work on the mu receptor and they get down regulated. And when you can repower up the mitochondria, it's able to and I'm kind of talking out my butt here, man, re kind of clean everything out quicker and better. Does that make sense? Like it, you know, it regenerates the cell quicker when it has more cofactors, makes the cell healthier. So it can take okay. more damage more, more or less. So it kind of gets it back online. And, um, NAD, there are some people that take it orally. I'm not really that sure how well it gets absorbed. It's a really big molecule. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's why a lot of people are doing it, uh, intravenously. I did it today though. And it does, I was listening you to it. You feel it? Yeah. Well, in a couple of ways. So Ben Greenfield was on Joe Rogan talking about it. Before that, Joe Rogan had David Sinclair on talking, and he's a big NAD researcher. And they use it on rats, and they're doing all these clinical trials. And Ben Greenfield said he did the dose I did today in like 15 minutes, and he was like ready to throw up. And I, I took mine oh, for an hour. Okay. I remember, I remember this conversation. Yeah, yeah. So it, 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 is it like a burning sensation or makes you nauseous? What is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it makes me your stomach keel over. I was a little bit lightheaded. Where did you, um, was it sub, was it in a fat IV. Like muscle? I know where, yeah. oh, so in your vein. Okay. Yeah. I got yeah. You. It goes directly in your vein. So you put it, yeah. Wow. You know, you put it in an IV bag and it goes directly into your vein. Um, you know, it usually takes an hour to two hours and, uh, yeah, the faster it went, the more uncomfortable I got. Um, unfortunately I had a, I had a patient today, so I didn't get a chance to really turn it up and see just how tough it was. Um, yeah. but we'll see. I, uh, you know, when I was working at Next Health, my C, uh, the CEO of the company was doing one because he heard really good things about it. Uh -huh. and, I, and I walked in on him while he was doing it. And he was like keeled over, like not doing well. He's like, Dr. Moeller, I don't know if we're going to offer this therapy. I can't hardly stand this stuff. And I saw him the next day. And he's like, Dr. Moeller, I feel great. <laughs> this stuff is awesome. It's totally worth it. We're going to put oh, it online. And, uh, and then again, I saw him like a week later. And I've been hearing really good things from my colleagues about it. So I went ahead and tried it out today on myself. And uh, I would say that I feel maybe 10 to 20%, a little more energetic, a little more, um, a little more vitality. So, but hmm. I mean, we, that, so uh, question, how often do you need to do this or how often should you do it? Well, I think they don't really know yet because the therapy hasn't been 
really out there, that long. Okay, so not how I'll should you, but what do most people, I mean, does the effects wear off and you can do it again? Or is this something that like, you know, just a few times a year people do it usually or what? I mean, some people think just like we'll get into talking about testosterone that it might actually downregulate your body's own ability to produce that's it. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was wondering. Okay. It's a, it's a real concern, but I don't think we have enough anecdotal evidence yeah. right now to make hey, that. Man, I try anything. I try anything once. Exactly. And that's kind of where <laughs> I was at. I'm like, let's give it a run. I don't think it's going to, you know, do anything yeah. extremely bad. Hey, so. so you mentioned the opiate um, addiction, how that could be potentially, you know, um, something to help with, with that. Uh, what about Ibogaine as, as yep. opiate? So is this a similar, I mean, I know that's, that's also a psychedelic yeah. and has like these, uh, different properties, I'm sure chemically altogether, but like, does, do you know, cause I've heard of people microdosing Ibogaine for like, like a pre-workout almost like yeah. almost like an antidepressant or Adderall or something. Um, uh, so how how would that work? Yeah, so ibogaine works by again resetting these mu receptors are what get hit when you're using these opiate when you're on opiates. Um, and again, to my understanding, it somehow resets those. I'm actually gonna have a guy on Can you the say podcast. That again? What what receptors? I think they're like mu, which is a Greek. You know, like the Greek letter mu. Okay. No. Um, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this okay. it's kind of it's kind of outside of my. Well, of my so I don't, I don't know. I'm sure I've like seen that and just skimmed over that part because I, I didn't know what what mu receptor was. Uh, yeah. If I saw it in writing, I may be more familiar with it. But okay, so um, do you know of anybody that does that? Yeah. No, I I'm gonna have a guy. I'm gonna have a guy on the podcast that has has. I think he'll be open to talking about all of that. I'm, like, I'm not, I think I'm more interested in in doing that than any other. Um, you know, substance in the psychedelic realm, like, because I, I just, from what I've read, I think maybe Tim Ferriss wrote about it in Tools of Titans. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. People but, microdosing with it. Right. Yeah. And is it, is it like a bark or something that we're, uh, it, but what is it? Ibogo, uh, no, it, not Ibogoda. Uh, yeah. Iboga? Iboga. Yeah. Iboga. Okay. And it's active constituent is Ibogaine. So you, it's kind of like, you know, like a psilocybin mushroom and psilocybin. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to have my buddy on that. It's, he worked at, I think he worked at Crossroads with Dr. Um, Dan Engel. So oh, okay. some experience there. I thought you're talking about a church because there's a Crossroads church that I've been to that yeah. Devane goes to. Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> He's been at Crossroads. Of that church. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll see. I don't know. I, I need to get more information on that, but the real big takeaway from NAD is just, yeah, kind of anti-aging, just feeling yeah. better, vitality. So, have you done a glutathione, glutathione yeah. injections? Yeah, I've done a lot of glutathione. Do you anything from that, or is it more Sometimes with, dude, sometimes with glutathione, you'll feel worse, because glutathione is a detox, and with your body, oh, okay. you okay. know, like alcohol, it goes to a different couple different steps and I'm probably going to butcher this. You take alcohol and it turns into like acetyl alcohol and then aldehyde and then yeah. acetone or so I don't know. I could, I, again, I'm, I'm messing that up, but the, the real takeaway from that is like Asians, there's a different, there's a mutation in that detox yeah. and it causes them to flush because halfway through they get kind of stuck. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, and metabolize, they metabolize it differently, right? Yeah. In one stage of the, okay. Yeah. And because of that, um, with, if you say like you're, you, you've been used to metabolizing something at a certain speed and then you do glutathione, there are times like I felt actually worse doing glutathione. Hmm. Um, but I do IVs with uh, vitamins and minerals and then I finish with the glutathione. Yeah. yeah. And I, I notice this, a, a, a huge difference if I do that, like before I go to the gym. I think it just yeah. kind of power everything. I wish I had access. I would like to try those things. Yeah, dude, they're fun. I, mean, I would imagine, and I guess everyone, I'm sure, different from person to person, but when you take a vitamin or even a pre-workout, you're only actually absorbing, digesting so much of it because of your stomach acid, because of whatever foods in your stomach, or 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 what you know, different variables. Well, like and that's the that's the there's there's like three huge arguments for IV therapy. Number one is what you just you hit on is you can take a supplement. But how much of that's really getting absorbed? You're looking at 20 percent right. absorption in a supplement. Um, right. Our food supplies, number one, just just what you eat is probably garbage. Like that's just the reality of the American diet. And then three, though, even the food that's organically grown, there's been a lot of monoculturing. Our soil is depleted, so we're not getting any vitamins and minerals in the in the good food that we eat. Yeah. And then and then to put that on top of that, how many people have GI issues? Whether it's uh, you know, a lot of people are in a sympathetic state. Yeah. So they don't produce enough stomach acid to really digest their food. So that also complicates being able to absorb nutrients. So mm -hmm. just by, if you just, you know, 
yeah. put a line in the vein and just shoot that stuff right in there. It's, it's a for sure way to make sure you're getting all those vitamins in there. Yeah. Or snort it. If you can crash it up and snort it, that yeah, is usually yeah. good too. There are people that do that. You know, <laughs> doing vitamin C, vitamin sneeze, vitamin sneeze, vitamin sneeze snorts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's seven times straight. Vitamin sneeze, man. The vitamin sneeze. So yeah, we'll see how I feel about it. I'm, I'm interested to see, uh, you know, if it's all what it's cracked out to be because, you know, like you and I were talking being in the in the biohacking world doing stuff like intermittent fasting bulletproof coffee like i have i have yet to find really anything that's that much better than caffeine to be honest man caffeine just yeah like- you know what oh man it gets yeah i go back and forth with caffeine because what i end up doing is and it's really stimulants in general i think uh instead of giving me energy it just increases my heart rate makes me sweat makes me hot and, and then i, I that, that has to do with detox that's, that's like kind of productive though like when i'm trying to like if I'm drinking coffee or, or taking a the thermogenic or something or pre-workout um, and all I can do and my heart rate's out of control, like I don't feel good. And, you know, I've, I've tried like l and I've tried Finaboot. I've tried different things to grapeseed extract, Hawthorne berry, like all these things that in theory might uh, have do something to do with blood pressure or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But sometimes uh, it hits me just perfect and yep. I don't have that, but I'm just in that, you know, that flow state with, with a certain amount of that's the high we're all chasing man it's it's an addiction like anything it else. is i was thinking that today too it's it is we're all chasing that feeling and uh man no one's fucking happy here in this world we it's artificial world yeah, we, man. and uh i was talking to to my doctor um about this because you know i've tried things like adderall and i've tried modafinil and i've tried um uh wellbutrin and i've tried different things plus caffeine and all the supplements that are stimulants that are legal um and man, some, they work for a while, then they don't. And it's like, all you end up doing is you're just, you're chasing that, that high and you're just, you're normal. Your baseline was here when you started taking it. But once you've experienced up here, yep. like back here feels like down here, you know? Yep. Uh, so it's, it's, I try to cycle out uh, off of stimulants and not rely on them and just be more content with being kind of uh, chill and not feeling like I need to go get it. And then, you know, after a while it's like, fuck, I've been lazy. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. All right. I'll, I'll take you know, whatever. it's really in, in, in the type of world we're in is not conducive to, um, you know, you really got to push yourself to keep up with people nowadays and we can kind of transition that into testosterone. Uh, so yeah, again, sure. a lot of you know that as an naturopathic doctor, um, I spend most of my time working with guys and measuring testosterone levels and man, testosterone levels to my understanding have really dropped in the last 50 years sperm counts i think average sperm counts 50 years ago were anywhere from 70 to 100 million and now they're down to 30 to 50 and that's really due to you know testosterone is one of the chief producers of that um what did you start you started looking into testosterone or did you get your testosterone measured by your doctor or what happened there yeah, I did. So I go to a doctor who's pretty with it. Like he, he's, uh, for this area, you know, in the Midwest, he, um, you know, he's a younger guy. He's, he's easier to talk to. So like I go in there kind of just full disclosure, telling them what I think, what I've done, what I feel. Um, and I was just kind of curious what was going on. I had a bunch of blood work done. Um, I think my, originally, uh, my vitamin D was low, um, everything else looked pretty good. Thyroid was fine and stuff. Testosterone, and I don't remember the exact number, man, but it was in the the low to normal range. Like it was mm-hmm. somewhere. It wasn't like you know, oh shit, some you need to do something now. Yeah, but it was see, like, hey, if you want to, this is an option. You can try this. Well, yeah. and that's cool that he was going that way because a lot of people don't. So reference ranges for testosterone, depending on what lab you go to, are anywhere from two hundred and fifty on the lower end up to eleven 1, hundred. And so again, what I try to tell people is like, they're clumping everyone from 18 to 81 in one group. So 250, if your blood serum level is 250, um, 251, you know, that's what you're supposed to be at when you're 81. But if you're, if you're 30, they're like, oh, you're good. You're at 251. And actually what's more important than actually measuring the total is what's called your free testosterone. So you should measure what's called sex hormone binding globulin. What that does is it, it kind of, it's a carrier. Um, Testosterone is bound to that albumin. Um, and also I think a cortisol binding, uh, globulin. So only like 5% of it's free. And that's really what you want to be looking at and measuring. Okay. Hey, but going back to something you said about how the testosterone has dipped, uh, mm-hmm. across the, across the board, I guess, for men today compared to what did you say? 50 years ago. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, okay, so what other factors are, are like involved here? Because I mean, I'm sure you obviously, 
the first step should be like, let's look at some lifestyle factors. Yeah. Like let's look yeah. at exercise. Let's look at diet. Let's look at sleep, alcohol intake, stimulant use, like all these things factor into it. But what do you think? Um, I mean, is there any one major thing that stands out to you with our, our, our modern lifestyle? Yeah. So, uh, what? cholesterol is the backbone to all your steroid hormones, LDL. Okay. That's where I was, so, go- that's where I was going. Yeah. I was wondering if you were going to mention cholesterol. Yeah. Specifically. yeah. So cholesterol turns into pregnenolone and then your body decides, okay, am I going to make cortisol or am I going to make testosterone and progesterone's in there as well. But again, the way I try to explain to my patients, if your body was a city, okay, and then you had wood as like raw material, okay, you only have so much wood, which is your cholesterol. If your city is really cold, you're going to burn that wood to create energy, cortisol. But if you have a lot of wood, then your body can burn it for energy and then also build buildings. That's what testosterone is. And we live in such a society right now that we're just so stress induced. So, um, uh, just, you know, being in traffic all day, finances, being stressed, not sleeping, you know, blue light, that's your screen that shuts off melatonin production. So your testosterone doesn't raise as much as night. They've shown that in guys that, you know, work night shift have decreased testosterone levels. Oh, I would imagine. Yeah, I would imagine. So I'm with you that I really try and work on those lifestyle stuff. But again, I think part of it's, you know, being outside, not sitting all day. It's, it's such you know. an uphill battle. I mean, like, and we, it's, exactly. you know, luckily we live in a time where we can, you know, maybe take one, take a hit here and there to, you know, for convenience or comfortability or comfortable uh, lifestyle. Um, mm. But then if you're going to do that, like, why not take advantage of these pharmaceutical, yeah. advanced, you know, this and is I, what- and I'm a naturopath, the doctor, man. So I really try and get to the root cause, but we just live in such a society now that it's just not conducive to being able to raise your testosterone naturally. Like yeah. we're just being hammered, you know, um, you know, plastics are what are called xenoestrogens, BPA, yeah. those bind on to estrogen receptors and still they, they mimic that in your body. Yeah. So that and fine and stress and, uh, you know, diet wise, you know, um, 40 to 50 grams of sugar in a single dose will lower your, your free oh, testosterone. Like I heard you say points. That. And that, that blew my mind. I can't believe that. Yeah. Do that again. Yeah. I think it's a hundred milligrams per deciliter. So that's the reference range, you know, two fifty okay, yeah. thousand. So How if, much you're at, if you're at like 500 and you do like a, like 40, somewhere between 40 to 70 grams, I'd have to look at the study. They mm-hmm. looked at guys like 45 minutes later and their testosterone was down a hundred points. Yeah. I think that's Maybe because that's of, not an exact science that matches up with each person, each situation. Yeah. So think about how many people that, that aren't really, oh, yeah. um, cognizant of their sugar intake how much that they're just like perpetuating that 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 chemistry in their body that um that environment yeah man they're just sucking down sodas lowering their tea all day and i think that's because what happens is when when blood sugar fills up your 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 blood sugar goes up you release insulin and you store sugar and one of the theories about blood sugar is like when it rises when you get too high too quick you overproduce insulin and then you store too much sugar and then your blood sugar drops again and then your body has to release cortisol to raise it back up so it's this constant like energy fluctuation and testosterone has been shown and this is another reason that i like testosterone it's been shown to increase insulin sensitivity so it is it is good for guys that are diabetic um guys who have higher testosterone levels um over 900 those are studies showing that it decreases their chance for alzheimer's over 700 decreased chance for heart heart disease and diabetes and I've seen it in some of my patients, guys that have had arthritis for years, you get their testosterone's in the higher end and it goes away. It's crazy, yeah. man. But when, when you treat people with testosterone, is there any type of, uh, so just like you were saying, the up and down kind of uh, the, the attempt your body makes for, to keep homeostasis. So yeah. you have elevated testosterone, do you ever, I mean, there is in theory the chance that you're going to have this spillover and this conversion, this aromatase enzyme that yes. will convert it to estrogen. So mm-hmm. do you have to keep uh, an eye on that too? Which yeah. Is- and that's kind of one thing I, I, you know, wanted to talk to you about and seeing how your practitioner handled your case, because, um, I don't, you know, a lot of doctors aren't educated on this. Like I've spent a lot of time going to special <clears throat> conferences, working with specialists in this area. And there are several things you need to watch. Like you're saying, testosterone can get converted into estrogen. Estrogen is a female hormone. It's highest when it's actually highest in the first half of the cycle, but it gets complicated with women in the second half. But it makes them moody, um, makes them gain weight. And that happens in guys. They get moody, they gain weight, they they feel unmotivated. It decreases libido, decreases erection strength. And so you really need to be monitoring that. So I monitor that. I start guys on T, monitor it in six weeks, and then I monitor again in three months. And if things are good, then six months. Yeah. Um, Testosterone also increases your red blood cell count. 
So mm-hmm. there's a big like controversy whether or not it's good for people with you know like heart disease. But basically, what happens is if your blood blood cell count goes up, your blood gets a little bit thicker. Then your heart has to pump harder to move the blood. So then your heart undergoes hypertrophy, meaning that the chambers muscles get stronger, which increases inside and it decreases ejaculate, ejaculatory. Wouldn't be or ejac? Yeah, I guess it is ejaculatory. Uh, <laughs> the volume that your heart can push out at once. So that's another thing you have to measure. And then you need to watch prostate just because um, if guys do have prostate cancer, testosterone will increase how quickly that that can. And that's so prevalent though. Prostate cancer is so prevalent. And I had I had an yeah. uncle that lived for like 30 years of prostate well, cancer. And that's the debate with prostate. 90% of the men who get to the age of 80 will have some form of prostate problem. And so whether or not it's benign prostate, or benign well, high prostate no, hypertrophy or – or if it's just their, te- or the te- like, I think it's nose, ears, and prostate just grow in men. So it's like, oh, well, shit. Yeah. Oh, my ears could use some size. And my, my nose is going to, it, it can't Sorry, handle bro. it. That's the way it's going. I've thought about that too. I can, I'm starting to see like the aging. Like, I can see what I'm going to look like when I'm 80, 90. And like, I don't know if I want to be around for that, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's the reality of the situation for most guys. And that's a conversation I have with them about quality of life versus like there are some potential risks, but there's a lot of potential benefits like heart disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, why settle? arthritis. Why, why settle for uh, living your life at 60, 70, even 80% if you like, if there's something that can give you a slight edge on uh, how you feel, then it will probably improve the way that, you know, the, your you quality. act. You then you, and this is one thing too, like I don't like telling guys, there's a study that came out that showed that guys who had low T, they had one group workout and they had one group that gave them testosterone. The group that just took testosterone put on more muscle than the group that worked out. And that's what, and, and without even working out. Yeah. So how much motivation is that? How much, you know, half of it's like a lot of guys don't want to go to the gym. So you put them on testosterone, then they want to go to the gym. Then their libido is up. Then their motivation yeah. is up. Yeah. And so there's a oh. lot of other things that, you know, come with that, that package. So, um, just to speak on what I, so, I mean, I, I did do some yeah, testosterone. Me in. So you did, you, you did T, what was your experience? Um, and I don't remember that it's been, well, I guess two, two, maybe, yeah, two years now since I did it. Um, so I did it at a time when- We also didn't talk about testicular shrinkage in a decrease. And that's where I was going. That's where I was going. Yeah. (laughs) Because you just mentioned like the increase in libido. Um, I did experience that at first. So here's the thing. First of all, I don't think my testosterone was low enough to really need this. I was just like, yeah, fuck it. Like, let me try it. Let's see what, and I was kind of at a point where, um, uh, I was going through like a rough spell in my own life. Like I was, un- I was not motivated to go to the gym. My confidence was low. Like I was having, I was at a place where my man, I was, I was smoking cigarettes and drinking like almost every day. So I was in a bad place at that time. Like I didn't have any good, very good uh, lifestyle at that point. My habits were just poor. So I used that and um, I did. I mean, I started working out more, like you said, like uh, I felt better. It got me out of a slump. Mm-hmm. So it was, it's like I mean, SSRIs, you know? It, like, exactly. It, is, it, was, it was like an antidepressant for me, not just the testosterone, but it's like the, uh, the ripple effect from taking that. So working out more, releasing more natural endorphins, not needing like this, uh, this, um, this thrill seeking, you know, risque behavior just to get like a dopamine rush too. Like I was just feeling better because my life was, was getting better basically. Uh-huh. Um, but then after a while, I got to the point where I did have the, the, I didn't have the increase in libido anymore. Yep. Uh, I almost felt lethargic uh, with it. What? And I, did you measure your estrogen? Um, no. So we never did any follow-up blood work. I remember, let's see, I took it. I only did it for, man, maybe three or four months. And I only did like a couple of, of, of vial of, of bottles worth. And it was testipinate. Do you remember? Um, yeah. Yeah, it was. Do you remember? So, I bet 200, 200 milligrams. Two fifty. I've never seen it in two fifty. I would say it was two hundred milligrams per mL. I've seen it fifty, a hundred, and maybe that could be two fifty. That's a pretty big dose I, this week. Okay, I, I don't remember, and I didn't use. I, I remember I like I I um what do you call it? like I titrated up, titrated down, whatever. Yeah. So I, I you know made small increases until I got to a certain dose. Then when I came off of it, I kind of like slowly lowered the dose each week. But um. I had like the testicular shrinkage. I had like some some lethargy. Like, uh, I just didn't feel, I was starting to feel like, eh, like the things that I wanted to take it for, I'm no longer feeling that benefit from. And so now I'm just jamming a needle in my ass every week just to like maintain. And so I talked to my doctor about coming off of it. What are my options? 
um, HCG is what mm-hmm. I went with. And man, I'll tell you, like, it was it was great like not only did like the libido come back the energy came back everything came back and it was like as i was weighing off of this uh cycle testosterone Mm -hmm. Um, so you did clomid for a little bit too didn't you i did do clomid uh as well and uh clomid i didn't notice as i i preferred hcg over clomid because um and it could have just been, that could be just in my head. I, I don't know. Oh, okay. So uh, I think what happened in, in your case and what I see with a lot of my patients is that um, when your testosterone gets so high so quick, it gets aromatized. Were you taking a Nasrazol or any type of aromatase inhibitor? Okay. I took it one time and that was like uh, a month in. I was at the Dude, doctor. Guys are terrible at that. And he, no, he, he didn't. And I didn't think about it, but like I took one. And it was like just a follow up a month and a half after I started or something like that, or maybe longer. And the nurse just like casually handed me this pill and said, here, you're supposed to take this. And she didn't really know what it was. I was like, what is it? She said, an astrazole. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, Am I supposed to take this often? And she said, no, when men are on this, we just uh, uh, suggest that you take it ever so often. And so I don't think that's the way that the drug is designed to work. No, it should be. I I have my patients take it uh, usually a day after the shot because- for some reason, the, your testosterone maxes out about two days after your shot. And okay. when it's max is when it's most likely to be converted. So that's yeah. when you should be taking the anastrozole. Anastrozole shuts off the aromatase enzyme, which prevents high amounts of estrogen. And I think literally a lot of what you're experiencing was high estrogen. Because estrogen, again, it's a P, it's like the PMS thing. Like, you just don't feel like you want to do anything. The libido is not there. Yeah. Unmotivated, just like just like crabby and whiny like yeah that's that's it that's it yeah and see so there's a difference too between hcg and clomid hcg is an lh agonist so your brain when it wants testosterone releases a hormone called luteinizing hormone luteinizing hormone so actually it releases something called gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus that goes to pituitary pituitary releases lh LH goes down to your testes and you produce testosterone. So the way I talk to my patients about that is I usually call, that's like your oven. Like imagine LH is, is your chef and your oven in the kitchen, okay? So you're not in the kitchen and you yell, hey, make me a pizza, okay? I want, I want five pizzas. You get five pizzas back, everything's all good. Now, for some reason, when you start asking, say, say you start asking for five and you only get one, then you're going to ask for 10 because you're, you're behind. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to feel like lethargic, libido's down, no motivation, arthritis, all this stuff. So what do you do? You order a pizza. That's exogenous testosterone. Dude comes to the door, and then you're getting pizza from outside. And then the, your oven shuts off. That's your testes. Your oven say, well, like, I don't need to do this. Don't but your testes, this. Yeah, but your testes are also important for ejaculatory volume, for producing sperm. And, you know, guys just like... To, Guys just like a big set of balls, man. Dang, no man. I balls. tell you what, that's my favorite thing about me is my big set of balls. Yeah. I mean, for real, man. It and, is. Uh, so, yeah, there's a big difference where, um, you know, testosterone, that's one thing, too, to understand that it can decrease your fertility. And again, this has to do with, you know, doing too much or too little. And you need to be monitored. A lot of guys are just like, hey, here's T, see you in six months. And it's like, by that point, you could be going through five months of having high estrogen. Yeah. So, yeah. And I and, think and, that I'm like, well, and for younger guys, you can just, why not start off with ACG and Clomid? That's what I'm doing with my patients now. I think because, that would be if I, and when I, I think I'd like to go back and try that again. Yeah. Um, I asked him, I think he said you can run it. Um, I mean, you want to take breaks uh, off of it eventually, I, yeah. I would imagine, but um, run a few cycles, like run a cycle quarterly or something, three, four times a year. That sounds like a good idea, just yeah. to, especially if you're uh, sexually active or you're trying to like have uh, reproduce, I guess in the, in the, in Oh the- yeah. ACG and Clomid are used in infertility. Yeah. 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 And so again, what the way ACG works is it, 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 it binds to the same receptor that LH does in your testes. So then you produce more on your own. Clomid actually blocks your brain from it's an estrogen antagonist. So it tells your brain, I'm not getting any estrogen. So usually the feedback comes back around. So even if you have sufficient amount of estrogen, it, it tells your brain you don't. Then you release gonadotropin releasing hormone, and that releases what's called LH and FSH. With both, okay. it will increase testosterone. And I actually like doing that in guys. Um, I've used that on myself. My T again was in the lower range, um, and I felt I felt kind of weird. And I backed the dose off, and I felt a lot better. So again, you what, what, dose, dose. what dose did you do? I mean, I know that it varies for different people, but uh, twelve milligrams. I did twelve point five milligrams every other day. 
Um, it can go all the way up to 25 to, to or actually, no, I think I did 25 milligrams every other day. And, um, that again was too much for me. Then the thing is with Clomid, it's half-life is 14 days. So oh, you cool. really, yeah, well it's cool, but it also like if you build it up and it gets too high, too quick, it's going to take a while to get out of your system. You still have to take it every other day. Um, to build it, you basically do so, it till it builds the levels up. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. So you can't take like just one mega dose of that shit and it works. You could, but I think that it would just overwhelm your system. That would put you all over the map with your mood probably too. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know if those studies have been done and I don't, mm. I don't want to go there. Cause I had like some, there were some times where I had some night sweats, feeling a little moody, a little edgy. Mm. Um, but I backed my dose off and I've been feeling, um, been feeling way better. So yes. it's super important. You know, a lot of people, and I think this is the future. You know, where a lot of, I have a lot of high functioning CEOs, athletes that are using this just to feel better and perform better in the workplace, just sleeping better. Uh, like I said, I, you know, one guy came in for libido. I gave him one, gave him one shot of testosterone. He came back the next week. We didn't even talk about arthritis, but he came back the next week and he was like, you know, I don't really feel anything with the libido yet, but does this stuff work on arthritis? I'm like, it can. They're like, I've had back pain for 15 years and it's prevented me from sleeping. And last night was one of the best. You know, the three out of three or four of the last seven days I've slept through the night, which hasn't wow. happened in years. So yeah. how much is that? Just getting your sleep back is, you know, and sometimes you got to band-aid stuff, you know? <clears throat> so that's testosterone. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm starting to play too with some peptides. Um, there are some peptides so, that kind of work on. Isn't there a, so you said, um, so G, was it GNRH, GRNH? Adotropin releasing hormone. I have to think about it. Yeah. Okay. So um, I believe you can uh, inject a dose of that, right? Can you not inject that? And it like yep. jump starts, it's like a one, like a one and done kind of deal though. Yeah, I'm not, I, I am not all that familiar with that, to be honest. I yeah, feel like I looked into it and it kind of was like, uh, I don't know enough about it. I'd have I to mean, if it was effective, it. I would think it'd be more popular. So you know, maybe, I heard about it a while back. One, I don't know if you're thinking of, there's a growth hormone analogs. That's GH. That's probably what I'm thinking of. Yeah, then. GHRP, growth hormone, growth hormone releasing hormone. Growth hormone releasing hormone. And that, that affects testosterone? No, but that would do, a, you know, growth hormone does a lot of things similar to testosterone. Oh, so. Yeah, that's funny. So, like, um, I read a book when I was in college. Uh, I can't think of the author. It was called, like, Alpha 2.0 Engineering, the something, the Engineering Man, something like that. Um, but it was basically about testosterone, growth hormone, insulin, leptin, ghrelin, and, like, how, you know, like, the way that if we can control these different hormones, um, how this like this effect that it has on, you know, so much of our life. Um, but growth hormone, um, it isn't that released at sleep at, during your sleep. Is that when it's released the most? Yeah. It's your biggest peak of growth hormone is while you're asleep. Yeah. Okay. So are there ways that you can, uh, what are some ways you can, I mean, fasting, I guess is one. Yep. What else can you do for, um, like optimizing growth hormone? Yeah. So, um, uh, gr growth hormone works reverse to insulin. So anytime you have sugar and you release, you know, you have any type of carbohydrate, you release insulin, yeah. insulin shuts off your growth hormone production. Um, some supplements, arginine, I think it's really one of the only ones that's like three to nine grams several times a day. And then now they're coming out with these peptides, they're growth hormone releasing hormones and analogs, which basically go to your brain and, and release them. Um, they're all, one is also a ghrelin agonist, so it makes you hungry. And it's called Amplomorlin. Uh, there was some old one, like Samarilin was a real popular one, but they started seeing that that messed with uh, prolactin levels and cortisol levels. Uh, amp, uh, Amplomorlin is going to, is, is to my understanding one of the better <clears throat> ones right now that and cj1295 combination i've tried that and i've noticed it made me more hungry and it seemed to help my brain actually yeah i'm actually going to be talking to a, a a physician advisor for taylor taylor made compounding it's who i get my uh, peptides from um, i'm going to be talking to him next week and hopefully i'm going to have a whole episode just about peptides talking about them so oh cool yeah, yeah. That, yeah, they got peptides for, you know, like SARM, selective antigen receptor modulators. Those yeah. actually increase um, the cell's ability, like how it uses testosterone. Like the, it modulates yeah. the receptor, increases them. So it makes so testosterone you, more efficient. So do you think there's some good things coming out of that, that, that area? Well, like see, that man, the thing with the peptides is they're all really new. It's hard to tell if, are there any real side effects? I've only seen, 
like one guy on a SARM and his T was kind of low, but he felt good. So I wonder if, you know, if you uplate, upregulate the receptor, then possibly your T can be lower and not affect you as much. Mm. So that might mitigate those negative effects. So instead of increasing your testosterone, well, hell, let's just increase the receptor sensitivity to it. Yeah. So, I tried Osterine. Osterine, is that yeah. it? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I can't remember the name. It's like, uh, uh rcpo on mk677 yeah that's it okay yes. that's that one yep. so uh i tried it and almost immediate noticeable like uh improvement in at the gym like yeah. immediately get pumped more vascular um but i noticed after like a week some testicular shrinkage so i was like oh, yeah. i'm not i'm not cool with that like that's well, not and i think what happens is when you upregulate the receptors then your body might actually compensate and decrease the testosterone hmm. maybe i don't know i think those yeah i'm kind of talking out my butt right now and trying to figure this out on my own yeah i don't know i'll, I'll that's that you're a doctor and you have to worry about like give it there's a disclaimer with what you have to say i do i'm doing that with all my but what's dude what's great is when i have patients like you walking like look doc i want to try this out will you prescribe this to me and i'm like, well you know obviously there has to be reasonable cause right, right. Um, but i do have a lot of patients right now i'm using another peptide called pt141 it's a melanocortin uh receptor agonist and there was actually they were using that for uh, bodybuilders were using that to get tanner and some guy noticed he was popping major woodies. So I'm, I'm trying to use Oh, right yeah. Now. Is it something? Oh, I think I've, I've heard about this too. Well, uh, Bromomelatine. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I've been trying that on a couple patients. Kind of mixed results right now, but we'll see. Huh. I had a friend of mine take it and he had an, an eight-hour erection. So be careful. Anytime huh. you have over a three-hour erection, you really need to shoot that thing down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah for real blood oh, you know blood will coagulate down in there and it's basically staying there and then you guys you got to take a big 18 gauge down there in the er and suck well, it out. the worst part about it though is no boner after that will ever compare it. it's like <laughs> this is you know you peaked with that shit it's like yeah. that's as good as it gets. you're done from there on out <laughs> so we'll see where the growth the growth hormone argument's really controversial too because growth hormone can increase you know tumors and and it has some negative side effects too yeah, yeah so it's yeah. all about keeping it in an optimal level and a lot of these peptides to my understanding help optimize you to the optimal level and that goes super physiological levels and that's one of the big things especially from a testosterone standpoint i think uh, you know it's a huge takeaway more is not better <laughs> i had a guy that was on are you familiar with like steroids like tren uh, yeah. Deca. So yeah. Trin and Deca, Androlin, Decanate, and Trin is Trenbolin. What these are, are three times as strong anabolically to andro- uh, androgenically. So uh, testosterone is a one to one. So for one muscle building, it has one androgenic effect, meaning that it, you know, um, you grow hair, you deepens your voice and all this, but what they don't with the steroids, that's an anabolic steroids is three times as much muscle. And this guy was an injecting, you know, three, like, and that's what bodybuilders do. They'll inject three different types. And these yeah. things have a one week half life. So if he's doing three different things twice a week, that is continuing to build up. Like his levels were over 3000. It's, it just said over 3000, like it cannot, it couldn't commute it. His estrogen yeah. was 150 for men. You want to see estrogen 15 to 30. So, and he was just, you know, he was down in the dumps. He was jacked, man. You know, good looking, you know, good physique, but he just wasn't really feeling it. I'm like, dude, it's your estrogen. So we'll see. We're kind of working on some stuff. We'll see what, yeah. what happens with it. So other than, so what kind of um, estrogen or aromatase enzyme inhibitors do you? I just use an astrazole. I haven't really played with anything else, but you uh, can yeah. take, uh, you can, and this again, isn't medical advice. This is just informational purposes. DIM. It's a huge long word. I, yeah, yeah. I've, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah. Dim. And then anything that really supports your liver. Because um, what happens is, you know, in your blood, it goes by your liver, and then your liver will pull estrogen out, bind to it, and then you poop it out, like bilirubin, uh, for instance. So anything that gives you, uh, you know, better liver function NAC, zinc, selenium, um, uh, milk, and acetyl, acetyl root, and acetylcysteine. Yeah. NAC. Selenium. What else do you say? Uh, so, uh, magnesium, so magnesium, zinc, selenium, vitamin C and NAC are all the backbones for creating glutathione. Glutathione is one of the main constituents used for, for phases of detox in your liver. So by supplementing those, you can, you know, have enough precursors to create more kind of like you take tyrosine to increase, um, epinephrine and dopamine and, and tryptophan to increase serotonin. Okay. So what about uh, milk thistle? Is that milk thistle? Yeah, milk thistle is a 
to my understanding, it actually helps upregulates liver enzymes. Okay. Um, I think I'd have to go back and look at the study. Silibum meranium is its Latin. And, uh, and actually MIC, M-I-C, which is methionine and isotylcholine is really good for the liver too. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of bodybuilders like Arnold and uh, uh, Colombo and those guys are all taking that stuff back in the bodybuilding days to protect their liver. And mm -hmm. those enzymes, those, you know, like an amino acid can do so many things to in the, throughout the body. Um, but, you know, those specifically have been shown to help with uh, liver uh, being liver protective. Yeah. And then, you know, eating good amounts of fiber. Fiber is really important to uh, bind to stuff and help poop it out. So, you know, and then not being, you know, hard on your liver with eating too much sugar. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The only, I mean, the only fiber I really intake anymore is some white rice, maybe once or twice a week and some oatmeal once or twice a week. Are you on your carnivore diet or what? Uh, no, it's, well, no, I, it's mostly like meat and dairy. It's, and it's, fruit. A, it's like a paleo diet without the veggies. It, yeah. It's a, it's somewhere <laughs> around like that. It, I don't follow any specific thing. I eat whatever I want, but like seafood uh, diet, you seafood, you eat it pretty much. But I don't, I mean, I have, you know, I mean, I have enough of an idea of like, no, I don't want that. I don't know how that's gonna make me feel or no, that's not productive to eat that right now. But I'm trying to eat a lot of calories keep my weight up but it is hard whenever I, I don't I'll eat a pizza like every other week and I'll eat a shitload when I eat it you know like I'll try to carb up at once do you notice a difference like do you think gluten or dairy affects you I don't know how I don't think dairy does I mean but the dairy that I do is is like the best quality dairy I can find yeah uh, but gluten I don't know man because uh sometimes I'll eat a pizza and I'll feel like shit for a couple days and like man I'll be like have weird feelings in my gut and my bowel yeah. movements are like so thrown off to where it's like, man, that wasn't worth it. Like it tasted great. I love that many calories at once, but like, uh, my stomach, it's not worth it in the long run. So I don't know. I've at this point, I, I pretty much know like what's going to be smart and what's not. I had the stupid idea to go get some boneless wings and, uh, drink, a, and drink a blue moon. Yeah. Uh, Christy wait. Cause she can't drink, but she watched me drink and eat some wings. And after that, I felt so shitty. Like it was just like a groggy, like bloated type feeling. It could have been the wheat beer or it could have been the, the breading wings. Who knows? But it sucks because at this point, like I can't just go do that shit and like just relax and enjoy how I feel because, uh, I don't know. I just, I know better and I don't do things that I know better than to do anymore. <laughs> yeah. I feel you. Um, what about, are you doing any fasting? Um, I haven't really in, in a while. I mean, I always do like probably about 12 hours. Like I finish a meal, you know, maybe I, a lot of times I'll eat like around eight o'clock and that's my last meal. And I won't eat again until maybe eight, nine, 10 the next day. But that's, I haven't had a, a good long fast in, in a while. Yeah, I've been doing the time restricted eat. Like I, uh, I've been eating from noon to eight, basically. So yeah, about a sixteen hour fast, and that in increases uh, autophagy, is your body's ability to kind of break down and get rid of all the crap out of its out of its body. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I like fasting personally. I yeah. think women women need to be a little more careful, like because of your hormonal regulations. There's a, there's some more stuff to kind of check out there, but. Um, I always feel better when I'm fasted. I mean, when I feel yeah. most tired is almost always after I've um, eaten something that didn't agree with. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Man, me too. And I, I'm, you, I hate that feeling of, you know, you have a whole day left ahead of you, but you kind of like one o'clock and you're just like, yeah. Yeah. blue moon and pizza hit me, man. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that that's the best nootropic that I've found is fasting. Like once you get yeah. to that, that certain, uh, there's like that threshold of like, where you're just kind of zooming, you know, you're, you're mm -hmm. in the zone. Have you done keto? Yeah. Um, keto? Uh, I don't know if I can say yes, because I've never gotten keto strips. Yeah. I've never like tested it, uh, but I've done, I mean, I'm always doing a pretty high fat diet and a pretty low carb diet. Yeah. I try to eat my carbs in like a, a, a certain window, which is usually like not daily, but like, mm -hmm. you know, every three days or so. Um, but I would imagine I hit keto. I mean, I, I dip into ketosis like several times a week. Yeah. I would think, but I don't yeah. Know. I mean, I don't know if, uh, again, I, I did a, the ketogenic diet at my first bodybuilding show. And for people who don't know what ketogenic is, it's Jesus. It's all the rage now, man. It gets so <laughs> popular so quick. And people are like, do you know what ketogenic is? I'm like, 
I did this in like 2011. Really right. yeah. 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 You talk about all the time with bulletproof coffee, but the, <laughs> the benefit with ketogenic diet is when your blood sugar is really low, your your liver starts to release these ketones, and that's basically fatty acids that your your body's metabolizing. And a lot of the body actually prefers that as a source, like your heart, your brain. Um, the problem is your red blood cells don't have they can't they can't use those for energy protection. That's why you still do need some blood glucose. Um, but but yeah, there's just crazy benefits because when you're talking about like insulin and sugar, it just it basically clears your your levels. Your your blood sugar is isn't um, up and down. Like we're talking like you eat sugar, your blood sugar goes up, and then and then you have energy. The sugar high, you know. You look at like a seven year old, yeah. and then all of a sudden insulin gets released, and then they drop, and then they crash. And yeah. then all of a sudden their body uses cortisol, the stress hormone to bring the blood sugar back online. And that's, that's literally what's killing people. That's what causes heart disease. That's what is causing diabetes. So to be able to control your blood glucose is, is to me like number one, it, it, anti-aging number one, like control your yeah. blood sugar. Yeah. And a lot oh, of times yeah. it comes down to like not eating sugar, like you're, like you're doing, you know? Yeah. Well, and Rob Wolf was talking, he talked about this in his first book, the paleo solution. I think that's when I, First, I think that's probably who I first found out about keto from, or, you know, when he talks about gluconeogenesis in, in that book. So if you are not consuming carbohydrates, your body has the ability to make glucose mm-hmm. uh, if needed. And plus, I believe, like, don't, doesn't your liver store some glucose at all times too? Yes. Glucose so, is stored as glycogen. Like but it takes time to adapt. So like you have yeah. people who are hyper or hypoglycemic, like my sister, I've tried to get her to do a low carb diet before. Um, or not, I can't even say I've tried to get her to do that, but I've yeah. suggested like fasting and, um, you know, it's a higher fat, lower carb. And she just feels better with oatmeal in the morning. And she kind of like, yep. we wouldn't get to that. She wouldn't really try it beyond well, that because she felt bad. And I, I th- and I, and I can't decide yet whether or not there are really actual genetic predispositions or one of my theories about aging is like you're saying your body can take anything and turn it into energy, whether it's fat, protein, or carbs. And so, but the thing is you use different enzymes and different paths, like going to work a different way. If you go to work the same way every day, your brain's going to have it, you know, mapped out and like, it's going to be most comfortable. You start going another way, your brain's like, I don't know this way. And you can do it a couple of times and you still don't feel that good about it. And I think that's what happens to humans is you also need enzymes and enzymes get upregulated when they're used more often. So it's really hard to decide when you're making diet changes with people. I don't know. No, you're, you're right. That's uh, I think that's, that's, that's spot on. It's, it's hard to change because there's like that. I mean, there's that, that control factor, like if being a habit, like she likes having the carbs, she likes the energy and the feeling that she gets. And plus there's probably like a serotonin release that she's getting from having like this high carb breakfast. I don't know. But whenever you take that out um, and you replace it with like uh like I don't like a bulletproof coffee or like in place with just eggs and, and cottage cheese or something like that, you know, like she doesn't feel the same. So she automatically like bails on that because yeah. on that whole approach because she felt bad. And then, I mean, she probably is, I mean, she's not lying about how she feels, mm-hmm. but I think that with keto, with low carb, uh, with sugar addiction, there is going to be that withdrawal period. There's that period where you don't feel good, man. Yeah. You got, you got to get past that. And it's not, it was easy for me because I just had the mindset like, okay, this is what's best. I'm going to do yeah. this. I don't give a fuck about how I feel about it. Really. Like I'm going to get to where my body can adapt to eating high fat, low carb and not depending on sugar. Uh, but if you don't have that mentality where you're going to do that regardless, then you're going to let your feeling bad with your, without carbs, like you're going to let that kind of override the faith that you have in, in the other way working. Yeah. And it's also in a, in like, like kind of the, one of the problem with addicts isn't necessarily that they're drinking alcohol. Like you can, it's, isn't the physical addiction. It's the emotional and the social oh, addiction. Yeah. You know what I mean, like part of food addiction is me even like, Oh, I'm going to go out to eat tonight. It's like, they're not going to have something super healthy for me there. And it's the same thing, you know, with people who have been eating the same way. They're just like, that's what they have in their cupboard, you know? So it's right. so easy to escape to that. And, and the way I, too, I like to talk to my patients, I call it train modification. I heard this from a, chiro, or a, yeah, it's a chiropractor, and I actually really like this. And he talked about how your, your body is basically a terrain, like your body's a forest. And because there are certain conditions there, whether it's swampy, whether it's dry, whether there's grass, certain things grow there. You know, like say if there's more grass, then you might have more squirrels. Um, you might have more foxes to eat the squirrels. Then you have a certain type of bird that's moving around. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so if you go in there and you like, you cut the grass, like that's going to throw off the whole ecosystem. Like then the frogs get eaten by this thing and then there's more flies. And then, and and our bodies are like that. When we eat things in the certain environment is a certain way, 
our bodies adapt to it. Like the microbiome, we know this, the bacteria in our stomach literally talk to our, talk to our brain, like they release serotonin. So if you're not making them happy, that's usually what we'll hear. And a lot of yeah. times these high sugar diets are feeding the bacteria <clears throat> in your gut and they're telling the brain what to eat. Have you seen right. that with like ants? What was that? Is that a tree? No. Spider? There's some type of uh, virus or parasite and it like goes into mouse brains and then it takes it and makes it, it, it oh. attracted to the smell of, of cat piss and it takes yeah. it. Yeah. So then it can affect the cat or something. Yeah. I don't, like I, it's, I, I, and that's literally like, you know what I mean? Like that's us and bacteria. The bacteria yeah. is literally telling us what to eat. You know, that, um, that analogy you just gave about how our body works with like the forest and like, uh, um, it, it makes me think of like neuroplasticity. So like there's the, the idea that our brain, is plastic like we it can grow and, and change the way we think by you know getting exposure and repetition like our brain can can rewire itself basically mm -hmm. so they used to think our brain was like after a certain age like it's 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 wired it is, it's Can't wired old yeah. dog new tricks right and so this idea of neuroplasticity is uh that stepping outside it i mean man it, it's so cool because there's so many levels to it but stepping outside your comfort zone like taking that new path to work like you were talking about going a different way like it wires your brain differently to think differently and the analogy that i when i first was learning about neuroplasticity um or the example is like it's like driving on a gravel road so those of you who've never been on a gravel road uh, you may not <laughs> yeah, get this but luck. a gravel road when it's freshly uh paved or you know like it's got a fresh coat of gravel there are no grooves in the road. Mm -hmm. So if some, one person drives down it and now it creates these little tiny grooves. Oh, you got like that. Again, the grooves go deeper and deeper and deeper. So not only does the, the road get easier, easier to drive on once you stay in the grooves, but getting out of the grooves is harder and like well, the wheels start shaking. So and that's it, one thing too, to add to the analogy, when a, when a road is just paved or graveled, it's, it's a float. Like when you're driving, yeah. you kind of like slide, like you're just kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah new really pavement. Analogy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 You're we know that Muller Brothers trucking, we rock roads. So I, I have a lot of experience gravel and road. Oh, okay. Okay, road cool. Builder. That's yeah. what I like my libertarian argument. Then people are like, who will build the roads? I'm like, me. <laughs> I am more about my dad and Muller Brothers. We built roads. So yeah. we haven't gotten into libertarianism either, man. We got a lot of. Well, I was actually, let's, okay. I was going to say something earlier. I and mean, we're talking about testosterone. Yeah. I know this is such a. Um, a hot topic right now and there's i've had several conversations with with my wife and i've just been thinking about a lot of things too with this whole testosterone and this toxic toxic masculinity yeah. um you know the the gender roles that that are 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 biological yeah. or cultural and societal um I mean, it's such a fascinating topic and i i, I try not to be too dogmatic and too close-minded because um uh I've just, I, I don't like that way because once you get, it's like we just talked about, once you get in those grooves, there's no getting you out of that. It's harder to get yep. you out of that. I want to, I want to stay open-minded and stay honest about a conversation. But, uh, I was talking to Christy last night about it and, uh, uh, it's like, dude, there's certain things I do. My, my dad and my dad's dad and my mom's dad, like I was around men growing up who my idea of, of the man, the gender, the role uh, it is very much built in, in things that are considered masculine, uh, mm -hmm. like working with your hands, like hard labor, like, uh, there's just certain things that they did that, um, man, they are masculine. And I, and I like that. Like, I like having a, a fucking beard, man. I like working out. There's mm -hmm. things about me that probably providing uh, that probably in providing, protecting, providing, yeah. procreating. Those are things that I think are biological in us. But whenever you say that now, it offends a man, a male who doesn't feel that way about it. Yep. Who doesn't identify with their testosterone is low and they need to go to could, the doctor. It, it very well could be. I, I, I believe that a hundred percent because I think that the hormone testosterone, I mean, hormones are chemical messengers, right? So like if this hormone is communicating to our body to act a certain way and behave a certain way, it's gotta be driving our thought process. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be driving. Just, yeah. Right, and testosterone it. decreases anxiety. Guys who have higher testosterone have lower light levels of anxiety and depression. I've seen guys who have had, you know, we had one patient, he had like, he was on four, four, um, antidepressant medications. And after being on testosterone, they were he's just peeling them off. I think last yeah. time we, I seen him, I mean, he had, he had I mean, one antidepressant left because it's like <laughs> testosterone is just such a hormone of like, things are good. 
let's go out there and be, yeah, be a man, like provide, well, protect. Well, what, uh, what, what characteristics or traits would you call masculine? Me? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, masculine, I, I usually think more of, uh, you know, yin and yang kind of, I guess, right handed, like giving, like a masculine is the sword and the feminine, but I don't know. It's, it's so hard to, to characterize one or the other. And in Chinese medicine, I believe the masculine is yang. And that's symbolized as a fire. Like if you had to think about yang, you think about a fire torched on top of a mountain. And if yeah. you think yin, which is the female, you think of uh, like a, a pool of water in a cave. So it's like cold, dark, and damp. And so masculine is masculine's very much like, like uh, I don't know, from a Jordan Peterson perspective, it's very much like borders, like, you know, like structure, like and implementing it and like, the way I talk about it too is like the father's job, like a kid's on the playground and he falls and hurts himself, comes back to the mom to kiss the boo-boos and the dad says, you get back out there, like to encourage, to protect, to, to, to bring out the best in people. And the feminine side to me is more about loving people unconditionally. The, the masculine is more like, you're not all that you could be and you could be, and because of that, we're all worse off. So you yeah. need to become your best self because that makes everyone around us better. Yeah. And the feminine is more of like, look, I'm going to love you no matter what. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. That's kind of my message. No, I, I'm with it. I, I hear you. Um, I think that the thing, okay, masculine and feminine are things that I associate as being like, um, I guess biological, but also um, there, there are things that it doesn't have to be like a man can show feminine traits and qualities and yeah. a woman can, can show the other ones too. So it doesn't have to be that like, um, Narrow. like just, right. Yeah. That, that uh, if you're a guy, you have to be um, more encouraging than loving. Right. Yeah. Because otherwise, and, and I don't know that uh, I don't know. I had a conversation with someone today about, uh, long story short, it's one of my childhood friends, um, like his mom was never around and he had brothers and sisters who stayed with his mom, but he moved down here from Chicago with his stepdad. And it was just like, she put it in her perspective was like, you know what? He just needed his mom's love more often. Like, cause he, the kid had, he got in a lot of trouble. He was a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. but like always just like, just overstepping boundaries and this stuff. And she put it like, he, he needed his, that mom love, that unconditional love from his mother. He was missing that. And uh, trying to earn it. Yeah. 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 So he was looking for that other places that he wasn't, he wasn't getting it from there. Um, and so I think that like, you know, two women can raise a child, two men can yeah. raise a child and have be a very healthy, productive parents and have a, a great uh, child. I, I mean, a child being yeah. raised up in a way that the, the kid isn't, stuck on childhood trauma isn't like feeling like he's missing something because didn't have a man and woman uh, i don't believe that so i don't think it's that black and white but uh yeah i think that a, a, a masculine characteristic and trait is also sometimes aggressive and it's also sometimes oh, yeah. um you know oh, don't man. Cross this I gotta, line. there's this book oh shit I, i'm listening to these youtube Oh man, you would love this. I actually want to read the book. It's like the four archetypes of the masculine, the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover. Have you read oh, that book? No. Dude, it's, dude, no. it's really good. Um, he breaks it down and how there's, there's the, we all have those aspects in us. We might be more dominant in one more than the other, but then there's the good king and then there's the shadow king. So uh -huh. Mufasa, the good king, Scar, the shadow king. And yeah. the shadow king is when it's like, he has the same characteristics, but they're not in check. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I think it's called story. There's a YouTube channel. It's called like stories of old. And this guy, this guy does a great analogies like Lord of the Rings, uh, Prometheus, Interstellar. And he goes in and kind of breaks down the mythological archetypes behind them. And he breaks down this book and he, he does 10 to 15 minutes talking about the king. And then he shows like, you know, Aragorn, like he's scared. Had you, you've seen Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Yeah. All of them. So, you know, he's like running from the, he's running from the power of, he knows the power that comes with being a king and he's running away from it. But he's like, look, dude, you got to go be the king. It, there's some humility there. So kind of better to be him than to be Denethor. The guy's like, we are the Kings of Gondor. You know, I'm the steward and I will protect it. You know, like looking at both the positive, like anything, there's a positive and negative aspect to all things. And there's a balance to all things. Yeah. And, and the, that's the worst thing about all this toxic masculinity stuff right now. Yeah. There's a level of masculinity that is, that is, 
that is inappropriate and it goes beyond its boundaries and it's uncontrolled and unchecked and it does terrible things. Just like a lot, you can love someone, you can coddle someone, you can coddle a man till he's in your basement and he's 70 years old and he's not doing anything with his life. So there's, there's a proper level of analysis on both ends. I think where there's a big outreach right now is like, I think we're not in trouble right now because we have more masculinity. We're in trouble because we have less. Testosterone levels are down. All of our teachers are female. Boys don't grow up with good role models. I think there's a 400% chance that boys who grow up in a father's home end up in prison. Okay? Like the, literally when you're talking about these statistics, like there's only certain statistics like single mother versus a parent, like single mother versus a couple. Like I don't know. I don't think it takes too much brains to realize that two people are going to be better than one. And I'm not saying that single moms can't do a great job. There are plenty of them out there that are doing an amazing job. But if it's kind of like the same thing with if you want to not be not if you don't want to be impoverished, it's like, you know, first thing you get a degree, you get a job, you get married and you have kids. If you do that, like you only have a 3% chance of being poor. Yeah. So, yeah. and I'm not saying that that's the way everyone should go. No. I'm just saying that like, if you follow the statistics and you want to do what's best and you want to play the game, you know, statistics on your side, you kind of follow those rules. And that's where society and culture and religion kind of come in and influence you in those ways. Now you yeah. can go against that. Like, don't get me wrong. I think that's kind of one of the big things with the church and being gay. Like, I don't, you don't want to be gay. You know, there are warnings in religion, I think probably for a reason, but go off, you know, I'm libertarian, go off and do it. And maybe, and, and maybe you'll discover something that's amazing. And I think that is one thing like with flat earthers and the censorship right now, I do not like censorship. I don't agree with flat earthers, but maybe like, imagine if someone said the Wright brothers are trying to fly, let's censor them. Don't give them any materials because what they're doing is not right. And it's impossible. You know, oh, it's like instead of yeah, instead of censoring these people because we're scared that someone's going to buy in, like instead of uh, worrying about teaching kids what to think, like teach them how to think, teach kids how to you know about discernment. Like, hmm, does this sound like this makes sense? No, then maybe I can just go ahead and dis you know disregard it mm -hmm. or whatever. But but to censor it uh, uh, with and using the excuse of like, um, well, it's false and we don't agree with it, so it shouldn't be allowed. Like yeah. what, what kind of message is that? And what kind of attitude is that? It's, it spreads fear is all it is. It's kind of like Alex Jones when he was, you know, Alex Jones. Yeah. Like he got, when he got banned, he just fulfilled his prophecy. He's like, they don't like me. The administration's trying to take me down. They're going to banish me. And they did. Yeah. Like, and like, like you, you can say that, like you, you shouldn't say the N word, but you can say all these hateful things. And then he gets banned for like talking about Sandy Hook, thinking that, okay, maybe there was like something fishy going on here. September 11th, maybe there's something fishier. Yeah. And they, they yeah. talked about that in the YouTube algorithms that they're now going to start. They're not going to allow people to find people like me. They said natural medicine. They said natural medicines without um, any benefit, like without, the, without any medical uh, science, they won't recommend those videos. It's such a it's like, shame. It's such a sham. We're like we're censored. I mean, well, and someone makes money off that. That's what. That's why I'm libertarian. I'm like, that's cool. Like, you want to censor? Like, okay, who's like, if you're gonna block one person, you know who gets it? The other person. So and that's really that's the the evil side of of capitalism. That's the downfall of it is because yeah, it's a great to have a free market and then this economy that's kind of opened up for grabs. Mm -hmm. But like, what happens when special interests start trumping? Like you know, what's best for humanity. And this yeah. is what happens. We, we grow up confused. We grow up bitter. We grow up uh, in, in like, we just perpetuate the same. We, we keep the, the game, we keep the game going, you know, because yeah. that's all we know. It's what's chasing. It's what we're supposed to chase. That's what's driving us. Yeah. And then AI comes in and just wipes us all out. Man. <laughs> I hope. That's, that's, where I I'm hope at, man. that's the best, best case scenario. Nah, man, I'm going to actually project into the eighth dimension. Hey, yeah. let, can I, can we talk about that real quick? Yeah, that's man. Great. So, uh, yeah, you're the one that taught you're the one that taught me about that. Was um, that really? Yeah. So I, I so I, I was at work one day and I used to talk to this uh this guy. Uh, this was in Southern Illinois when I was working at GNC, and a guy would come in and talk about uh, uh, qigong with me and like energy and all these yeah. things. And he's and I think he told me about like this ability that these ancient shamans and meditators had to go out of body. Now, out of body experiences, OBE are very well documented. Like. I had a friend in the ER and she tells me stories about like people that die in car accidents and then um, they wake up and then they knew who was in the operating room. They're like, Oh, I remember you, you were in there with me. And then the ah. nurse was like, you remember me? He's like, you weren't in there. And they're like, how did he know? You know, and maybe like it all went in subconsciously, but they're, they're documented cases of people like following, you know, 
and, and I don't, again, I don't know how realistic this is, but I heard about that. And then I've heard about what's called astral rejection is where you sit down in a meditative state and you actually come out of yourself. There's a book called journeys out of body by uh, Robert Monroe. And I, I mean, I don't really know what I think about it now. I think looking back on it, I think more metaphorically, I think it's the ability to out to look outside of yourself. I don't know if you actually leave this, you know, in this three dimensional realm, if your spirit comes out and you fly around like a ghost, that's what I originally mm -hmm. thought. Um, but I had used that as a way to start dream journaling. And then I got into lucid dreaming a lot. And that's yeah. a real experience where you get yeah. your dream and you're able to do what you want. See, I don't know that I've really experienced that because I've like, oh, I've yeah. tried to, and it, and it's like, uh, I have a, like one of my friends says he does it all the time, but then whenever he tells me what he's doing, it's like, well, that's what I'm doing. So I don't know if it, where the disconnect is there, but well, I, I think part of lucid dreaming too, there are points in it that I go, there's, there's like a full blown lucid dream. Like I'm dreaming and I decide to fly, but then there's also times when that happens and I can't control everything. And then there's also like, ah, oh, there's a bear. Don't. And then it like decides to run away from me. So yeah. there's kind of like a different level of, I did control that subconsciously because if it happened just as it did, then it probably would have got me. I don't know though. Yeah. Well, and, and if that's the case, then any dream that's not a lucid dream where you just have no control over anything, like that sounds like that we could turn into a nightmare pretty quickly. Cause I'd feel like there's always like, even it's like a subconscious control of like what's directing the dream, you know? But I, I don't know. I don't know that I that I I don't understand dreams very well because obviously, like there, are, you know, no one really knows. But like Carl yeah. Young, how, put, how is that man? The thing that we do a third of the time, we hardly know we anything about. Yeah. And so I started. Uh, I'm on day four, I think. So we'll see how long this goes. But I have a, a notebook by my bed, and I'm just making bullet points of what I've dreamt the last few nights. When I wake up, just write like what I can remember, and that's it. And don't don't worry about like thinking too hard on it, just what stuck out, what stood out to me and then go back and reread it because, uh, I think my brain's working on some problems. Uh, my subconscious is working on some problems that, uh, that if I don't pay attention to, then I'm not making any progress. But if you pay attention to these things, um, I might make some progress. And that kind of goes into meditation. It's like most people are not meditating We're they're sitting there thinking with their eyes closed, you know? Yeah. And I do that too. But there so. are some things that race like, and this is, I know this is, if I'll take a nap in the afternoon and I, and I, it's really hard for me to actually nap, but for like, you know, minute three to 10, my mind is just running, 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 running. And then I yeah. kind of fall asleep and my mind's running and I wake up and it's like, I'll, I'll figure a problem out or something, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I think you're right that, that they've shown that the ability for, you know, they teach people things, they have them sleep and then they wake up the next morning and they, they remember it better. Yeah. It's super important. I wonder if that's what, um, so what do you think about this idea? This is just a theory, but like, so Sadhguru says that you don't need sleep, you need restfulness. Like mm -hmm. he's, he claims that he stayed awake for like, I mean, man, he, he made a claim yeah, about three, like 30 days or something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but okay. What about this idea that when we are tired, like this mental fatigue is because we're, you know, we've got so many things uh, cooking in the kitchen of our brain in the back, in the back burner mm -hmm. that we don't, we've not tended to. And we don't even like our immediate focus is on like what we're doing, the task at hand, but our brain's still chewing on yep. these things that are going on. Mm -hmm. And where we are, are needing sleep when we finally fall asleep, it's like the ability to file those things away where they're supposed to go and solve those problems. And when we wake up feeling refreshed, it's because like, okay, you put things to rest. Like you close these cases, you, you know, you, you put them in the folder, put them in the cabinet and they're okay. Now we got a clear mind. Uh, does that make any sense? Or is yeah, that just, definitely, I think 100%, I think in there's, who is that guy? Matthew Walker. He was on the Joe Rogan experience. He's a big sleep guy. Um, I want to read his book next. Um, he was good, man. Did you listen to him? I don't think so. Yeah. I think Walker's his name. He's a Harvard PhD. Is he like a kind of maybe blonde headed ish? Yeah, like, curly haired guy. The guy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then I think that I remember him. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was good. It was probably over a year ago already, but yeah, I walked away learning some things. So, but I don't, how, what are we doing on time now? We're probably a little over an hour, huh? I don't Let's know. Just, I, yeah. go, I think we got I on here at 530. Well, I don't think my, I don't know how, well, we can close it down here. Cause I don't know as far as megabytes files and all that logistics. Oh, yeah. so. All right, people. Thanks for hanging with us. Rhett, you got any messages for the end of the week? Um, no, eat some eggs and some protein and um eat your veggies 
Yeah, I guess so. I am a carnivore. I'm a closet carnivore, I think. Closet Sorry. Carnivore. Yeah. All right, peeps. Until next time.